Hello and welcome to our video summarising all you need to know about the Industrial Revolution. My name is Barbara and in this video we'll examine the Industrial Revolution from its early beginnings in the 1700s through to its apex and we'll examine all the different areas and industries that were impacted by the Industrial Revolution. Now this video is going to be really useful if you're studying this as part of your exams or even as part of your coursework as we delve into all the details and also look at all the different inventors that you need to be aware of when discussing this area in history. So let's get started. Now, when considering the Industrial Revolution in context, the 1750s to 1800s were a time of huge revolution and industrial change. The main changes were, firstly, by 1914, England had become a great trading nation and a worldwide empire, and it covered a fifth of the globe thanks to the Industrial Revolution. There was also a 260% growth in population as a result of the Industrial Revolution. There was, of course, a shift from domestic industry, so in other words, cottage work, things that were done and processed in small little cottages by individual people and families, to mass production in factories. In addition, there was a move from water and wind power to steam engines during the Industrial Revolution, and there was a revolution in transport and communications from relying on canals and pack horses to railways and the telegraph. Now, when you're thinking about the Industrial Revolution, one of the massive impacts it had was on the growth of towns. So, do bear in mind that the Industrial Revolution really has its roots in England, and so this video will focus on the Industrial Revolution within the context of the UK. So, in 1750, about 15% of the population lived in towns across England, and in 1900, this was about 85%, so this was a massive explosion in population growth. This meant that there were far more people around to work in new industries. However, this also caused problems because many more people needed foods and homes and this meant that poverty was increasing. And we'll be talking later on about the downsides of the Industrial Revolution. Also, by 1900, London had 4.5 million inhabitants and the biggest other towns were Glasgow with 760,000 inhabitants and Liverpool which had 685,000 people. Manchester and Birmingham had more than half a million people each and much of the population had moved from the southeast to the industrialised coal field areas in the north and the Midlands. So the Industrial Revolution caused these shifts in patterns. Now, the Industrial Revolution itself was a time of great achievement. In the area of agriculture, Charles Turnip Townsend introduced the Norfolk four-course rotation of wheat, turnips, barley and clover to his farm, and Robert Bakewell used selective breeding to develop the new Leicester sheep. Arthur Young promoted new methods to a wider audience. In the area of industry, Richard R. Wright's mill at Cromford heralded the factory age of the textile industry. Production of iron increased 30-fold and production of coal increased 20-fold. And Newcomen and Watt contributed to the development of steam power to drive machinery more efficiently. And of course, always remember the name of Watt is named after the inventors. When you look at things like battery power, when things are talked about in terms of wattage, this is named after the inventor himself. When it comes to the area of transport and communications, Thomas Telford built roads and communication canals in 1700s, and George Stevenson and Isambard Kingdom Brunel oversaw the railway mania of the 1800s. There had previously been no fast way of transporting goods and people around the country. However, canals did exist, and so most materials were transported by boats to towns and cities which had to be located along canal routes. There were also many scientific discoveries and technological innovations that changed society and industry massively. So when it comes to the causes of the Industrial Revolution, the historian Arnold Toynbee created the idea that in the years between 1780 and 1830, there was of course an Industrial Revolution. So Toynbee, who wrote this in 1884 and the first historians of the Industrial Revolution, thought that industrial growth had been stimulated by Britain's trade. There was a need to develop more manufactured goods and ready-made markets around the world through the British Empire. Also, A. H. John, 1961, thought that growth had been stimulated by the Agricultural Revolution, which we're going to talk about shortly. This had increased the population and therefore domestic demand. 
W.W. Rostow in 1960 traced the growth of output back to capital investment, which had allowed expansion and innovation. And Musson and Robinson in 1969 credited science and technology with the Industrial Revolution, and they thought that technological advancement made improvement in industry inevitable. And recently, the African historian Joseph Inikori in 1987 has focused on the profits made by slave traders, which provided money for investment in British industry. So, the Industrial Revolution, of course, involved innovation, capital investment, and increased output in the following industry. So, firstly, one of the industries that really benefited was the textiles industry. So, John Kay's flying shuttle was very successful in innovating weaving. Spinning technology needed frequent development over the next 50 years before weaving experienced major further changes. Now, James Hargreaves' Spinning Jenny in, 19, in 1764 and later Richard Arkwright's Water Frame in 1769, as well as Samuel Crompton's Mule in 1779, were spinning machines that all improved upon the quality and quantity of spun yarn, which of course impacted the textiles industry. Edmund Cartwright's power loom in 1785 was the first steam-powered weaving machine and many of these inventions were powered by James Watt's steam engines in 1765. Large purpose-built factories were a new idea, for instance Arkwright's Mills uh, Cromford, which was full of machines. Output as a result increased 15-fold in the century between 1815 to 1914. Now in the industry of iron and steel, Abraham Darby smelted iron using coke in 1709. Henry Court's puddling process made route iron in 1784 and Henry Bessemer's Bessemer converter in 1856 as well as the Gilchrist Thomas process in 1879 made steel. Huge iron works, for example, Richard Corchet's Sifferthur works in South Wales and John Roebuck's Caron works in Scotland were also influential and the production of pig iron increased 30-fold in the century between 1815 and 1914. Also, when it came to the coal industry, better coal mining techniques allowed deeper mines, for instance roof and pillar, working to support the roof, upcast and downshafts, downcast shafts provided ventilation, and the Davy lamp in 1815 invented the Humphrey Davy invented by Humphrey Davy helped to prevent gas explosions. In 1914, the coal industry employed a million men in 3,000 collieries, and production of coal increased 20-fold in the century between 1815 and 1914. When it came to the area in the industry of steam power, in around 1712, Thomas Newcomen built the first commercially successful steam engine to pump water out of the mines. James Watt also made steam engines much more efficient in the 1760s and 1770s, giving huge savings in fuel. His other improvements meant steam engines could replace water and horsepower in a wide variety of industries, which in turn allowed factories to be built everywhere. So what were the consequences of all of these different innovations in industry? So many traditional historians believe that industrial advancements such as machinery and railways revolutionised Britain and of course by extension revolutionised other parts of the world, boosting the economy and laying the foundations for long term change both in Britain but also outside of Britain globally. So let's first look at the agricultural sector in the Industrial Revolution and more specific information relating to all the different innovations in this area. So the historian Arnold Toynbee created the idea that between 1750 and 1830 there was an agricultural revolution which perhaps predated or preceded the Industrial Revolution. He and other historians of the time presented this agricultural revolution as the work of heroes. Now, Jethro Tull was one of these so-called heroes who promoted the use of the seed drill and the use of horses to pull machinery rather than oxen, which of course made agricultural techniques far more efficient. Another important inventor was Charles Turnip Townsend, who introduced the turnip and the Norfolk four-course rotation of wheat, turnips, barley, clover onto his farm. Furthermore, Robert Bakewell used selective breeding to develop the new Leicester sheep and the Colling brothers promoted the selective breeding of longhorn cattle. Moreover, 
Thomas Koch of Hokeham publicised his new ideas by inviting hundreds of people to his sheep sharing agricultural shows and Arthur Young wrote about the new methods and spread these ideas more widely. Also, the parliamentary enclosure movement was said to have destroyed the old three-field system and created the modern patchwork of enclosed fields. So what were the consequences of the agricultural revolution? Now firstly, without the agricultural revolution, the growing population of England would have starved and the industrial revolution would have been stifled. So that's why it was so important and in many ways it preceded, so it had to go before the industrial revolution which came into full effect. Secondly, it used to be thought that enclosure displaced farm workers to the towns, but historians now doubt this. In the short term, enclosure needed more labourers to build the farms and the fences. In the long term, however, the increased use of machinery meant that fewer farm workers were needed. They left the land and went to the industrial towns in the north of England. The agricultural revolution can therefore be seen as really significant. Although historians debate on whether or not it is of equal significance to the Industrial Revolution, it certainly did its bit in propelling the wider Industrial Revolution. Also, the Industrial Revolution certainly did more for the country's development. In other words, it did more for England's development. However, it may not have been possible or even existed without the Agricultural Revolution. Now let's look at the important role of transport and communications and how it shifted during the Industrial Revolution in detail. So the Industrial Revolution saw a dramatic improvement in transport and communications and this involved innovation, capital investment and increases in, firstly, roads. So General Wade, Jack Metcalf, Thomas Telford and John McAdam developed better roads with firm foundations, drainage and a smooth surface. Ever since the 17th century, turnpike trusts were set up to improve main roads for which a toll was charged, and this predated the standard period of the Industrial Revolution. Now, in the early 1800s, investment in Britain's roads was more than £3 million a year, and between 1803 and 1821, Thomas Telford alone built 1,000 miles of road, including 1,000 bridges. His greatest achievement was the London Hollyhead Road, which was constructed between 1815 to 1826. However, others had already been building new roads over the past several hundred years. Other areas that really saw changes in the Industrial Revolution was the canal system. So some people argue that the first modern canal was the Sankey Brook Navigation. It was used to transport coal which links directly to the Industrial Revolution. Others say it was the Bridge Water Canal built by the Duke of Bridgewater in 1761. Now, about £20 million was invested in canal building between 1755 and 1835, and there was what was called canal mania in the 1790s, and famous canal builders include James Brindley and Thomas Telford. The fact that more money was spent on canals could be seen as a natural development as the country gets richer and trade is more necessary, and by 1850, the canal network covered 4,000 miles. However, one thing to note is that canals had existed long before this period. The Exeter Canal had been built way back in 1566. It's the viewpoint of some that the developments made during the Industrial Revolution were really no different to those made beforehand. Perhaps maybe they just increased in intensity. Now, when it came to railways, the first railway was the Stockton and Darlington Railway in 1825. George Stevenson then built the Rocket in 1829 and significant engineering achievements included the London Underground in 1863 and the Fourth Bridge in 1890. There was a railway mania in the 1840s and £3 billion was spent building the railways between 1845 and 1900. In 1870, 423 million passengers travelled on 16,000 miles of line. Now, other developments of transport and communications include the 1837 Samuel Morse's invention of the telegraph. Then in 1837, Rowland Hill invents the postage stamp. In 1839, Kirkpatrick Macmillan invented the bicycle. In 1843, Isambard Kingdom Brunel built the Great Britain steamship using screw propellers. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell patented the telephone. In 1885, Carl Benz invented the motor car. 
Now, what were the effects of the Industrial Revolution on transport and communication? So firstly, the world shrank. In 1700, it took four days to get from London to Manchester, but in 1880, it took just four hours. Raw materials, goods and foods, for example, fresh milk and post, thus arrived faster. Secondly, this of course impacted economic growth. So the railways needed bricks, cement, sleepers, iron and coal, and as a result, these industries were stimulated in terms of their own growth. And in 1847, more than a quarter of a million people worked on the railways and the wages helped the economy grow. Thirdly, when it came to finance, huge numbers of people bought shares in railway companies. Although many later lost their money when the boom ended, this of course really stimulated the growth of finance. Fourthly, the 1844 Railway Regulation Act improved conditions in third class and in 1883 the Cheap Trains Act made railway companies offer a greater number of cheap trains for workers and transport became available for more people than ever before. And fifthly, by 1880 it became clear that speedier travel and railway timetables needed the whole country to take up a national standardised time. Before this date, people used local time that varied from place to place. Seventhly, the growth of the shipping industry allowed a huge growth in worldwide trade and by 1902 the whole British Empire was linked together by a network of telegraph cables called the All Red Line. Now of course education experienced a massive shift during the Industrial Revolution. So in the 1800s formal education became available to even the poorest people. Now, when it comes to the impact of the Industrial Revolution on schools, before the 1800s, education wasn't free and poor children got whatever education they could in dame schools or Sunday schools. Now, in 1833, the government passed the Factory Act, making two hours of education a day compulsory for children working in factories. So these children, of course, who were working in factories were from among the poorest families. However, the government granted money for them and, of course, it granted money to charities to help schools for the first time educate these poorer children. In 1844, the Ragged Schools Union was set up to give schooling to very poor children. Furthermore, the Public Schools Act in 1868 reformed Britain's public schools such as Eton and Harrow. And in 1870, Foster's Act set up state-funded board schools for primary education. And in 1880, the Education Act made school attendance compulsory for children up to the age of 12. The 1902 Education Act established a system of secondary schools. So some historians say that the improvements were made because the public were beginning to complain about the lack of education and support for young children who worked long and hard days in factories. And these historians believe that the government wanted to simply educate people so that they could make more money for the country. Another area that really experienced a change in the sector of education was, of course, universities. So between 1900 and 1909, red brick universities were founded in places like Birmingham, Liverpool, Leeds, Manchester, Sheffield and Bristol, concentrating on hands-on courses such as science and engineering. These, of course, differed from universities such as Oxford and Cambridge, which primarily taught less vocational and more traditional subjects such as history and the classics. So, for instance, if you've ever noticed in university prospectuses or university listings, Oxbridge as a title being used as opposed to Red Brick University, this really has its roots in these changes. Another important concept that became really important when it came to education during the Industrial Revolution was the idea of self-help, which was really important during the Victorian era. Now, mechanics institutes were set up in many towns to provide night school education for working men and public libraries were built in many cities so that more people had access to improve their lives during the free time. Also, the Museums Act of 1845 gave town councils with large boroughs the power to set up museums for the public. Also, members of parliament thought that working class people could improve their lives by visiting the museums instead of spending their free time in pubs. Now, of course, the Industrial Revolution brought so many benefits in different areas that we've looked at. However, of course, there were downsides to the Industrial Revolution. 
Now, firstly, when it came to working conditions in factories, long working hours were seen as standard. Normal shifts in factories were between 12 to 14 hours a day, and workers had to clean the machines even during the mealtime. So a lot of workers didn't even have enough time to even eat. Now, low wages was another important issue. So male workers at the time earned 15 shillings, which is equivalent to 75 pence a week. But women and children were paid much less, with women earning 7 shillings, which is equivalent to 35 pence a week, and children 3 shillings, which is equivalent to 15 pence a week. Therefore, employers preferred to employ women and children, and many men were sacked when they reached adulthood, then they had to be supported by their wives and children. Although it's really difficult to determine what the relative value of this money is, we can at least assume and agree that this still wasn't very much at the time. Another issue was the problem of cruel discipline. So there was frequent strapping, which means hitting with a leather strap. Other punishments included hanging iron weights around children's necks, hanging them from the roofs in baskets and nailing children's ears to the table and dousing them in water butts to keep them awake. So there was very, very cruel methods of enforcing disciplines, especially on children workers within factories. Furthermore, there were a lot of fierce fines imposed both on children but also on male and female workers. These were imposed for things as simple as talking or whistling or leaving the room without permission or having just a little dirt on the machine. It was claimed that employers even altered the time on clocks to make their workers late so that they could just find them and not pay them enough. Some employers demanded that their overseers raise a minimum amount for, of each week's for, for fines. Furthermore, accidents were a real issue. Forcing children, for instance, to crawl into dangerous, unguarded machinery caused a lot of accidents. For instance, 40% of accident cases at the Manchester Infirmary, which is essentially the Manchester Hospital at the time, in 1833, were factory accidents. So a lot of people really got mutilated, especially young children. Health, of course, was an issue. So cotton thread, for instance, in the textile industry had to be spun in damp and warm conditions. And then going straight into the cold night air led to many cases of pneumonia because people would work in these damp, warm conditions all day, so in very stuffy conditions. And in the winter time, they'd then go straight back out into the cold air to go home. And so they would fall very sick. Also within factories, the air was full of dust, which led to chest and lung diseases, and loud noise made by machines damaged a lot of workers' hearing. Now, when it came to working conditions in mines, this was no better. Trappers as young as four years old sat all day in the dark of a mine, opening the doors for coal trucks to pass through. Also, young putters pushed tubs, and children as young as six carried coal for hewers. Women hurriers pulled tubs with a chain that went around the middles and between the legs, which is often a humiliating experience. Hewers cut the coal with pickaxes and seams only 18 inches high, and wages were so low that there were stories of pregnant women giving birth down in the pit of mines one day and being back at work the next. There were also accidents like roof falls, explosions and shaft accidents and drowning was frequent. So also the life expectancy for some people was very low. Now, of course, the Industrial Revolution did have a negative impact when it came to living conditions in cities, especially for the poorest. So pollution was a key issue. Coal was used to heat houses, cook food and heat water to produce steam to power factory mines. However, burning coal created smoke, which led to terrible pollution. Also, there was a problem with overcrowding. Due to large numbers of people moving to the cities, there were not enough houses for all these people to live in. Low wages and high rents caused families to live in as small a space as possible and sometimes whole families lived in one room. Disease was also really common. So typhus, typhoid, tuberculosis and cholera all existed in the cities of England and cholera reached England for the first time in 1830 and there were further major epidemics in 1832 and 1848. Also overcrowding, housing of low standard and poor quality water supplies all helped spread disease. 
Moreover, waste disposal was a massive issue. So gutters were filled with litter and the streets were covered in horse manure collected by boys to sell to farmers. Human waste was discharged directly into sewers, which flowed straight into rivers. And these are the same rivers that people sometimes took their drinking water from. In London, Parliament had to stop work because of the smell from the Thames became too much and this period was called the Great Stink. Now there was also very poor quality housing for very low class workers. So houses were built really close together so there was little light or fresh air inside them and they didn't have running water and people found it really hard to stay clean and hygienic. Houses often suffered from damp due to the thin walls and roofs were made out of cheap materials and many households shared a single outside toilet which was often a hole in the ground. There was also a lack of fresh water so people could get water from a variety of places such as streams, wells and sandpipes but this water was often polluted by human waste, the same human waste that flowed through the sewers and into rivers. So that's all when it comes to understanding the Industrial Revolution in depth. If you found this video useful, we'd really appreciate it if you gave it a big thumbs up. And also if you could consider subscribing to our channel where you can get access to a lot of academic materials in this area of history and indeed in several areas of history, as well as English and other academic areas such as maths. We hope you enjoyed this video and thank you so much for listening.